I should not be able to do that um, with a broadhead. <laughs> yeah, don't uh, stop doing that. <laughs> and that that these are the ones that you know somebody could buy this and it's just not good, right? Like you don't want. I wouldn't want to put this on my arrow and go shoot an animal because it's not going to bleed and hemorrhage like Matt was talking about earlier. It's not going to. It's just going to punch a hole in the animal. It's not going to bleed. But This segment of DOD TV is brought to you by Rage Broadheads, leading the evolution in lethal technology. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Drury Outdoors 100% Wild Podcast, episode number 193. Easy for you to say. I don't. <laughs> it's not. That's like the, the third take at it. <laughs> Imposter products. All right. Well, you're Tim Chelswick. I'm Matt Drury, and we have a special guest on today. John Severson from uh, Fairdyne. He's a chief commercial officer. We're going to be talking about Chinese knockoff products in the archery industry, which is a which is a real problem. We teased it a f- maybe two or three episodes episodes ago and John is helping us make good on the promise to to have the conversation. What's up John? How's it going man? Good. How are you guys? Good. So we you know little backstory John we've worked together for you and even before I started here you know you with Mark and Terry for how many years now? I mean it's been a long time. Yeah it's been uh since um um it's been 15, 20 years. It's been a long time. Yeah. So, so John was, has been with, you know, Faradine, but before that, you know, it was Rage Broadheads and, and well, field, was it Field Logic? Field Logic. Yeah. Yeah. Glendell targets, block targets, uh, Rage Broadheads. You know, there was several things under that umbrella. And so, uh, you know, I think we, I'm trying to think what year did Rage come out? 2006 was our first ATA show. Yeah. Um, so, so, so we've been with you so, guys since yeah. 06, I think since the first yep. year, since the very beginning. And, yeah. And if anybody has watched, you know, you don't have to be, you'd have to be hiding under a rock to not see or hear Mark or Terry kind of giving rage a lot of accolades and, yeah. you know, their theory on this. And I know, I know that's a huge debate, you know, the, a kind of a stale debate, honestly, you're either a fixed blade guy or a mechanical <laughs> guy and Mark and Terry, a long time ago, they were in a, a camp or somewhere with a Dr. Strickland, I believe. And uh, he was a heart surgeon. I think, I think I got all you're this. You're talking right. about cuz? Cause I don't no, think he's, no, 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 I don't think it's a side yeah, job. Warren Strickland. <laughs> Warren Strickland. He was talking yeah. about, you know, him or him or hemorrhaging and how you need a bigger cut on contact to really get that blood, you know, to, to basically get out quicker. No one get makes out. Me bleed my own blood. Yeah. So anyhow, it was, uh, they, they started with that, that strychnine, I think was the first mechanical that they shot. Okay. And then, Larry and and John here feel logic. They came out with that rage broadhead and, and we've never kind of looked back. I, I mean, they've shot, I would literally think there's hundreds of deer that they have shot between all the does. Sure. And, I mean, hell there were some years where dad was shooting 20 or 30 does with Holy a bow cats. on his farm, uh, you know? And so, cause he has such a high deer density. And mm-hmm. uh, so <laughs> it, it's not, it's not, I'm not being facetious when I'm saying they've killed hundreds of deer. And, and as far as a team goes, we'll kill 60 to 70 deer a year mm-hmm. with the rage broadhead yeah. on the team. And that's been for, you know, over a decade. So it's, we have field tested it and, and, and approved. I mean, ultimately you still want that great angle. You still want, you know, everything to line up. You want mm-hmm. a perfect hit, but in those instances where you don't, I mean, it has, it has, killed a few deer for us. It really has. So anyhow, I just kind of wanted to, I'm sure everybody's heard that before from us, but you know, they're such good partners of ours and we really do believe in that broadhead and, and, and what it's done for us. And we haven't really seen that mechanical failure that you hear the kind of the naysayers talk about, you know, maybe once or twice with a prototype through the 15 years, Mm -hmm. you know, but, but otherwise it's pretty Pretty pretty, dependable. Yeah, it really has been. And now that they're doing the no collars, it's gone even more dependable. It's kind of dummy proof, you know? Yeah. I, I'm just personally going to put in a plug for the no collar tripan if that's ever in the works there, John. That tripan is my my rage of uh, of choice, and so if I have any say, in we it. just launched it. We just launched yes. one. The, the virtual 21 ATA show. We've launched a, a 
no collar tri band. Very excited about that. Yeah. So before we yeah. jumped on the podcast, we were talking about how this year we weren't at the ATA or the Shot Show or any of that. Uh, you know, those types of trade shows, and you know that is the one downfall. I didn't get a seat. Usually, you know, we sit in an hour meeting with with John and and Terry Quinn there, and they'll tell us about the new products, and that's always the interesting thing to see what's new for the year. But we'll just have to do it virtually. So kind of give us take us through that a little bit, John. What's new and what you guys are excited yeah. about? Yeah. And I mean, the biggest thing is too. this last year, when it came to our new product development cycle, um, when it, in the, in the early part of the year, in the spring, when we're really in the, the heat of our development, um, we had a whole palette of new products that we were going to bring to market in 21. And about the time that we were starting to roll all these different things out, that's when COVID hit. And so at that point, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen. And we kind of, I'm not going to say we, we pulled, we did, we pulled in the reins a little bit on all the different product offerings that we're going to bring to the table in, in 21. And, you know, we, we pared it down, if you will. So we don't have as many new products this year as we have in, in past years, but we still have a, a whole bunch of stuff. And, you know, we've got some, um, some new developments in, in IQ with the redesigning of our pins. We, um, we've got a, a couple the new broadhead would be the tripan NC from Rage. Um, you know, we've got uh, um, a couple different things that we we bring in relaunching our S4 brand. Um, you know, just some some different things, but just not as many as we've had in the past, just because of that that COVID hit when when we uh, were right in the heat of it, and we didn't know what was going to happen, and so we're like, well, we better, you know, we're going to have to shut down. We had to shut down for ninety days, and. Uh, so we were all nervous. And then once the shutdown was over, that's when the, the bomb hit. And then we were able, we, we shipped a lot of product, um, actually when we were shut down and, uh, um, that depleted our inventory, especially on targets. That's where we got, you know, that's the hardest thing for us to catch up on has been on targets. And, and, uh, but once the, the May hit, you know, the end of May, um, and, and June really started to rocket the, you know, people can't do the things that they have done in the past years. They can't go to their kids sporting events. They can't do the different things that they've done. So they needed to do something else and that's get outside and, and hunt and, and do the things that they used to do. And it's really been a, a big kick in the, the rear for our business over the course of this past, the past six months, especially it's been crazy. Yeah, it's one of those so. deals where the entire industry and, and a lot of industries for that matter, when that shutdown happened, it you you so everybody's inventory got depleted, but there was no nothing coming to replace it. Mm-hmm. And and right. everybody's been in the same boat where they're sold out of all inventory for the year and they're all playing catch up. And I, I imagine it's gotta be a pretty tough thing mm-hmm. as a manufacturer to try to predict because it's there's a fine science to, to what you guys do as a manufacturer and trying to predict all right, we need, we're going to get this many people buying, you know, the box stores, the mom and pops, and then the consumer straight to consumer or whatever it might be. So we got to have this amount of product. And mm-hmm. if there's anything that's made overseas, you got to pre-plan that, you know, it's just, there's a lot that goes into it. So then you're coming off this boom where it's like, Hey, our year was fantastic. But then when you figure out what your next year is going to be, it's got to be a little bit, a little bit of a daunting task because it's like, all right, you know, I, I shouldn't say, you know, but projections are saying by summertime, things are going to kind of open back up and kind of start getting back to normal. So it's like, all right, do we go all in and, and, Mm -hmm. and go over what we produced last year? Or do we kind of pare back? It's a real fine line between having a hell of a year or we did okay. Right. Yep. And the other part of it in, in the world that we live in, you know, we have about 400 employees and on any given day, our percentage of COVID fallout is pretty great. So being able to have an accurate production plan sucks because, you know, today, I don't know how many people didn't show up today because they either have COVID or um, were with someone that had it or whatever the case may be. So we, we, we have this constant attrition of, of employees on any, any given day. And it makes it really hard to, to produce and do the things that we need to do, you know? And, and uh, so, yeah, but we, we, we plan long and uh, we're hoping that this kind of the, the things that people did getting out and hunting and doing the things that they love to do will stick because it's something that, you know, maybe this guy hadn't 
he hadn't hunted in the past five or six years or this lady or whatever the case may be, had never tried it. And now all of a sudden they like it. And, you know, I want to keep doing this and, and hope that's our hope, you know? And I think that um, if anything, throughout the course of this past year has taught people to, um, I'm trying to think how to say it, like just go back to their roots, if you will, and, oh, yeah. and, you know, uh, do the things that make them happy and get outside and get your kids outside and do the things that, that, you know, to do, you learn to do when you're young and, and get out and do it. So we'll see, but yeah, it's, it's been good for us for sure. One of the things that makes us happy is feedback from our listeners. We've I'm got, trying to wedge that in. We've got some shout outs. <laughs> <laughs> Don't laugh, John. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Carlin Miller on DeerCast says, love the podcast, keep it up. And then he gave us a thumbs up. All right. So Bucky Doe Downer on YouTube. I don't think that's his real name. First of all, w- why not? Warning. First five minute is Matt talking about sausage. Ah, oh, you didn't <laughs> warn me about that. I feedback. gave you the show sheet ahead of the, I don't read the, the show. show I don't read the show sheet. <laughs> <laughs> Just well, wasted effort. Full disclosure. It's Oberly dog jerk. <laughs> <laughs> But it's true. The first five minutes of that last show of two shows ago was mostly talking about whatever overly dog. Thanks Bucky. So, you know, we're having John on to talk about this imposter products and that's, this is something that's been going on in the industry forever. I mean, it's, it goes, goes on in a lot of industries, the Chinese knockoff, so to speak. Well, it's any, anything overseas is knocking it off. It's everybody's trying to knock you off. Seems like. Yeah. Yeah. So, so John, what are you guys seeing in terms of, uh, not Im- imposter products, their performance, maybe feedback that you get from consumers that thought they got a rage broadhead, but they got something else. Yep. And you know, it's whenever there's a, a anything that's popular um, and it doesn't matter if it's our industry or any industry, if, if it's a hydro flask, for example, you know, this is a very sought after item. It's going to get knocked off. It doesn't matter what it is. Someone, they're going to knock it off. They're going to figure it out. And and, and kind of going back to the show before that, you know, this started when Rage was super popular when we first started the brand back in, in 2006. And within the first year, um, our forecast and what we planned to build, like we doubled it and tripled it. And year after year after year, we just kept. And so the thing that you find is at the ATA show, for example, there's Chinese people that'll walk around and they'll take, they'll take pictures, they'll steal the products. And so we had to start locking our products oh, on the pegs crap. because they would actually steal them. Um, as soon as we came out with them, they'd steal them, take them back and they reverse engineer them and knock them off. And, uh, so it's just, it's been a, it's been a challenge and we've done a lot of different things over the years to try to, um, combat it. But, you know, no matter what you do, there's, they're, they're very crafty. And so they'll come up with, how they name it. So, you know, we have our, we have IP on, on our technology and how the broadhead works. Um, we have trademarks on our names and all the different names that, that, you know, whether it be slip cam, shop collar, you name it, all those different things are trademarked. Mm-hmm. And so you can defend those things, but you know, a trademark or a patent is only as good as how much you want to spend to defend it. And so, like I say, they're very crafty and they'll, they'll change the name so we can, we can stop production or stop things coming into the country that are named or that, that say slip cam or that say rage or whatever the case may be. And then they just evolve. So they change the name to uh, butterfly or whatever. <laughs> and literally they'll, Too they'll honest. come in in a different way. And so we just have to constantly, it's like playing whack-a-mole constantly. Um, and you know, it, it could be, you know, our hypodermic, for example, you know, I've got some sitting right here behind me that, that, you know, they look just like our broadheads. And, uh, uh, they, so this, this particular guy bought or made it's uh, a dozen, a dozen of these broadheads for basically, uh, I think it's 20 bucks, something like that, where, you know, it's, and they're not good. And that's the, the thing that, that, you know, we used to have our get your game or your money back guarantee on rage broadheads. And we'd have a lot of people calling. And so my customer service staff has to be really adept at looking at one of these broadheads and figuring out, is this a real one or is it a fake one? Cause a lot of people would would go and shoot an animal and do whatever, or have poor performance and then call us and be like, Hey, uh, you know, I didn't get my deer 
but let's see the broadhead. And then you get it and it's a, it's a fake. So they bought fakes and then they call us to try to get their money back or, you know, complain or whatever the case may be. So that's something that we see constantly um, every, every day. So how do you combat that from a, from a education to your consumer or as a consumer, what should one look for when you're, you know, there's certain areas where, Hey, just don't buy it in this, on this platform or don't buy it here and you'll be safe or what, you know, what would you suggest? Well, if, if you're, you know, these broadheads, for example, you know, a pack of, of hypodermics, you know, or hypodermic NCs is going to sell for 45 bucks. If you're paying $15 for six broadheads, you're probably not getting the real thing. And, you know, that's the biggest thing that I would say is, you know, when you're going on Amazon or you're going to go on, you know, any of these, these type of e-commerce type sites and you see these multiple and they're not called rage, they're called, you know, whatever type of broadhead, um, it's probably not real. And that's the biggest thing that I would say is, you know, rage banded products, um, are going to be generally the real thing. It's hard to, it's hard to, to tell though. And uh, in all honesty, when you look at a lot of these different things, cause like I say, they're very crafty and they can come up with different ways to name them and they can, they can sneak that stuff in. So like, you know, this broadhead, for example, you can see, I, I should not be able to do that. <laughs> um, with a broadhead. <laughs> yeah. Don't uh, stop doing that. <laughs> and that, that these are the ones that, you know, somebody could buy this and it's just not good. Right. Like you don't want, I wouldn't want to put this on my arrow and go shoot an animal. Cause it's not going to bleed and hemorrhage. Like Matt was talking about earlier. It's not going to, it's just going to punch a hole in the animal. It's not going to bleed, but for, fu- um, for the shot for- collar, like I say, the, the, just the design of the Pharaoh, you can, you can see that it's different in the way that, I know what the feral should look like, and this is not what the feral should look like. And, and a consumer isn't going to know that, right? Like they're, right. they're not going to be able to look at this one versus a different one and be able to tell, you know, this is a, this is a knockoff, but really it's price point. Um, price point should it's price yeah. give you the heads up. And for folks yep. who are listening to the show, John was running his fingers down <laughs> the cutting edge of like pe- that knockoff <laughs> broadhead. <laughs> and it was disturbing to see, but it, it didn't slice his fingers open. So clearly it's, it's not a rage. He's still with us. <laughs> well, one of the, so uh, a friend of a friend was buying these like $13 knockoff rages. This is and- bull- I can tell already. This and is Tim was buying the knockoff. Try not, try not to implicate anyone here. <laughs> the guy kept losing deer. And my buddy said to him, he was like, why do you keep, why do you, he's like, well, they're only 13 bucks for three of them. And he kept losing deer because these things weren't deploying. It's like the, the, the thing that you want the most performance out of when you shoot a deer is the thing you're you're not going to skimp on. Like, okay, so you save 20, 30 bucks, but what did it really cost you? Time. (laughs) Time, your deer. deer. Yeah, (laughs) everything. Like, why bother even going deer hunting if you're going to hunt with something that's substandard like that? So, John, I'm curious... As you guys are seeing these these units, what is inferior? Are they using different different alloys? Different material, uh, different techniques, is how they sharpen the blades, different um, design in the shock collar itself, uh, different things. So like on a Rage hypodermic, I'll use it as an example because it's I'm not trying to blow my own horn, but it's the best selling broadhead that's ever been made. Like th- we've sold more Rage hypodermic broadheads than all of the other broadhead companies combined mm. of all their broadheads, like just that one. So we sell a lot of them. And um, the way that it's designed is it's got a shock collar and the shock collar has pedals on it. And those pedals are designed to break away when the broadhead deploys. Now this one that I'm looking at, it's the, it doesn't have pedals. It's just a collar that's <laughs> on there. So what, what it's going to collar. do is it's going to hang up on those, the, the way that the blade deploys, it's going to hang up on that shot collar and it's not going to deploy cleanly like a, a, a broadhead should do. Um, and, you know, like that. And then the material in the ferrule itself, um, you know, we use a, a special kind of steel that's in that ferrule. Uh-huh. Um, and I'm betting they didn't. And then when it comes to the blade, the blade material is one thing. And I, you know, without testing this or testing its hardness or whatever the case may be. I don't know what they use, but how the broadhead is sharpened is another way that, that we set ourselves apart from our competition and how we 
there's a special kind of steel that we use. It's hardened to a special alloy or hardness, Rockwell hardness, and then it's sharpened a certain way. So all those different steps are the things that we do to make a Rage Broadhead what it is. It's not just any old blade material. It's not just any old barrel material. Like everything that, that goes into that broadhead was custom designed for a broadhead um, to be that that machine that it is truly. So, I, I, I'm fascinated by Chinese people walking around ATA stealing stuff. Stealing, like, have you have you ever had to confront yep. someone? Oh yeah. How yeah, does that I mean, go? You want to punch Matt me right knows, now, but you won't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as Matt knows, I don't spend a lot of time on the floor at the ATA show. I have a we have offsite meeting rooms, or we used to have an upper level meeting room that we would meet in, and most of my time is spent in meetings, um, doing that. So I'm not down on the floor, but my people that are down on the floor, they're like, they'll come in, you know, when I have a break or whatever, like, I just, I just stopped this guy and I did this. And, you know, I had to take broadheads out of a guy's bag that had took him off the the peg and put him in his bag. And, and, uh, you know, a lot of times because of our new product development cycle, we don't have a ton of samples of things when we're at the ATA show that early in the year. Mm -hmm. And so we may only have six or seven packs of, you know, this particular broadhead and, and those to get those six or seven packs, they're like five grand a pack because of the price of like prototyping and all the different things you have to do. So like we watch them, but we'll literally at the end of the show, you know, we're out, we don't have any, um, whatever it is, you know, it could be, you know, say it was our, I'm not going to bring it up, but our own core broadhead or whatever, it could be any of those things. And and at the end of the show, you have none of them. So the reps need it for, they want it. They're going to a big, a big account next week and they need a sample to show them. It's like, well, sorry, we don't have them because they all got stolen. Perfect. Um, so, and it's, it's just, it's how it is. It sucks, but it is what it is. Trust me. This is going to be great. It's a great product. I don't have any, but you really, really yeah. going to like it. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you wonder yeah, how it would it, go if the tables were turned and like an American got caught in China stealing you know, something. <laughs> you wouldn't gonna, come home. <laughs> no, you would be in some gulag somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Or your hand would get chopped off. But, but yeah, I mean, it, we have to deal with it. You know, a lot of my, my, partners or competitors in the industry. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of popular products that are, that are knocked off constantly. And it's just a, it's a never ending battle. And, you know, we've teamed up with, um, some of our partners or competitors or whatever you want to call them in the past and, and looked at ways that we could try to do things. But the the frustrating part is that it costs a lot of money. And, and if I'm going to do a, you know, any type of a legal, there's lots of different things I can do legally. But when you do any of those legal things, to me, law is basically interpretation of words. That's all it is, really. You have to, you can look at this and you can get around. It could be the way that this patent's written. It could be the way that this trademark's written, whatever. You can get around certain things. And so that's what these these Chinese do is, you know, we'll we'll spend a million dollars to to go and, and federally protect rage, for example, Mm -hmm. all they have to do is change it to a different name. And we just spent a million dollars to, to stop things coming into the country labeled rage when they can just put it as camping equipment. And so it's tough. Like you, you, you can sit here and throw money at it all day long. um, But at the end of the day, it comes down to the consumers not buying it. Right. Like they, they need to understand that this is different than these cheap broadheads. Like you were saying, your buddy um, was buying these cheap broadheads and he's losing yeah. deer, buddy, um, buddy. you know, just don't do it and just don't <laughs> buy them. And then they don't have, they don't have no uh, the, their outlet, you know? And, and mm-hmm. at the end of the day, uh, it's just, you know, that's really the only way that, that you can do it is, is, trust the product. And and, and like you said, the most important part and well, the most important part of any hunt is, is the person that's sitting behind the bow, behind the gun, whatever the case may be. Um, but when it comes to to archery, this, this little broadhead here is, is an extremely important part of it. And, And like I've always said from day one, you know, it's, it's the first one thing that people are going to just rant and rave about if it, if it worked well, but it's the first thing they're going to say 
that lost cost them their deer. You know, my broadhead didn't open. My broadhead didn't do this or whatever. It's always the broadhead's fault. It's never their fault as to where they shot it. And, you know, I've seen, like Matt was saying, thousands, thousands and thousands and thousands of, of animals throughout my years, 20 years of doing this that, you know, have been killed. And I know with all the confidence in the world that if someone shoots an animal with a rage broadhead and they didn't hit it in the shoulder blade, if it's somewhere in the middle, the deer's going to die. Like it's going to die. You just have to give it enough time. Um, in, in that's the biggest mistake that people make is going after the animal too soon. But at the end of the day, I know it's going to work. And if they had an issue and, you know, from when we were in Georgia, when we were up here, no matter what, it really started to get bad when we were, you know, probably like 2012 was when it really started to get bad as far as what we got to see on, on rage knockoffs. Um, but it, uh, it, it, like we had to do trainings for our customer service staff so that they could learn, you know, they have pictures, this or this, this or this, you know, when it came to like the shot collar. So for example, we used to have on our uh, rage marquee and our packaging, the marquee that's on the top, that's a sticker that's in that marquee. So whether people know that or not, we used to have a sticker on that marquee saying free sticker. And when we started to see these knockoffs, they had that in their package, but the free sticker sticker was, it was just a photocopy of that, um, <laughs> that marquee. So that was one of the ways that my customer service people could tell that it was a knockoff or not a knockoff is by that marquee. If they got it and that little sticker wasn't a sticker, it was just a, a copy. Then they knew it was a, a knockoff. And I mean, just things like right down to that level, that's the type of stuff they do. They'll copy the whole package, everything. That's cool. No, like this, Fake this guy stickers. didn't, he just puts them in a bag and <laughs> doesn't even try. Like a crack dealer. Well, I, I don't think a lot of people <laughs> know. I wouldn't know. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't think many people know this, but <laughs> someone knocked off deer cast early on. Yeah. There was, it was very brief, but yeah, it was the first year, I think. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. Out of the like gates. right month in maybe. Yeah. We had to, uh, I think it was in the Apple the yeah. Apple store. Yeah. And we had to prove that we owned originated, you know, all that stuff to, and who knows how many people signed up for it. You know, it was a brief period, but yeah. But yeah. And thought, oh, this thing sucks. Like there's nothing here. Yeah. We're used to our normal customer. <laughs> I'll hold it. <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> but, but it just goes to show like, like just in the theft of intellectual property yeah. is so widespread. And if people don't think there's an actual war going on between the, between the Chinese government, because Chinese business is owned and run by the Chinese government. It's one and the same. It's not like here in the States where there is a separation. It's one and the same same. And so the intellectual theft warfare that's happening right now is, is, is costing the U S millions and, oh. and probably billions of dollars. And on the digital side of it, it's, it's way worse. Mm -hmm. it, I, I don't know. I shouldn't say way worse, but it's, it's, it's on extreme scales and, and they're, gr they're good at it. You know, yeah. they're good at doing these things. So uh, it's not, you know, it's one thing that they manufacture who knows how many of the world's goods. So they have these plants that can basically make anything. Yeah. So that's part of it, but they also have the technology side is just uh, incredible what they can do. So it's hard to combat it unless you have a uh, government on your side that are enforcing embargoes, They're like making some tough decisions that may not be popular, but right. at least gives the uh, those other governments a, a little pause to say, oh, you know what? Maybe we should not so blatantly steal their stuff. Yeah. And, and like John said, if there's no market for it, if, if individuals aren't making the decision to make those purchases, then the reality is there's always going to be somebody that looks for the best deal. And that's, yep. you know, and, and, and the Amazons of the world have made that so easy to just say, okay, here are the 50 choices. Oh, there's the cheapest one. I'll have it tomorrow. <laughs> one of the things I told my wife, because she was looking at something on Amazon for a Christmas present this year. If you find a company that has a name that isn't a word, like you should, you should think about, we, you should, you should have a little Chelsea. suspicion about that. That's a Norwegian <laughs> word, but like, like some of these, some of these companies just have like, it's just a bunch of vowels together. It's, it's not, it's not mm -hmm. even an English word. But y'all don't say that. I did. <laughs> and, and so, like, so watch out for, for that, that that's a good early tell. And then price point is price is point's huge. I mean, everybody wants to save a dollar. I get it, but 
What's it worth? I mean, sometimes you're getting what you, a lot of times you're getting what you're paying for there. Yep. Yeah. Well, and these these companies have gotten really good at at advertising, like on social media outlets, on Facebook, and and I mean, you even see them on Snapchat. Like these companies, there's a company right now called Outdoors, and they're oh, wow. out of England, and they are knocking off our lighted knock, and they've gone so far as to go on to YouTube and take people's videos. Like they probably have some of your videos Perfect. on there, like <laughs> as testimonials um, talking about these different products and it's our, it's knockoffs of our stuff, but they're using your videos on their website to promote and push these products. And then they're, they're advertising them on social media. And so like that one, we actually sent a letter to um, about two months ago, three months ago, and they stopped, but now, so I have a monthly call with my attorneys on this, on IP. And, uh, and so they just, on this last call that I just had a week ago, they're basically saying, you know, Hey, outdoors is back. And, uh, they have like my true fire release where we have, uh, tr the trap tab, which is our, the kind of the thing that you see when, when someone's shooting our release and, and that, that tab is a patented thing that we have. So they had our, that, our, one of our releases called the smoke right on their, their opening page of the. Um, of their site. Well, my attorney's order. So you have to have a physical sample of whatever it is. If you're going to stop someone or do whatever, you have to prove that they're actually doing it. So first and you have to when pay. they got the release, <laughs> it was not, it wasn't what was pictured. So some other release, but they're using our smoke image as like the bait to get people all buy this. And then it's something else. This just this past weekend, I'm, I'm sitting at home and I was scrolling through, I think it was Facebook maybe. And I came across a sponsored ad and it had the bone collector logo on it. And, uh, and I was like, and they were selling jewel, like female jewelry that was not outdoor related female jewelry. And it was weird. It was like, it had nothing to do with it. So I took a screenshot of it and I sent it over to boo, uh, Jackson, Bishop over there, who's kind of their general manager or whatever. And, okay. and I was like, Hey, just a heads up. You know, I think somebody's, he's like those SOBs. He's like, <laughs> he goes, we sent him a letter, you know, months ago and you know, it just, he's familiar with the, Oh, the he knew exactly who it was. And, and <clears throat> this happened to the crush before where I scrolled across something and I saw their logo and it was supposedly them promoting something. And I screenshot and I sent the tiff and I'm like, Hey, just a heads up. You know, that's, you see this stuff all the time. And I would love to know if somebody saw something of ours that felt odd, yeah. let us know about it. And that's, mm -hmm. that's, you know, so it just, it, it is, it does happen, happen a it's lot. Infuriating. Yeah. So Ridiculous. anyhow, all right. Well, how about we help our buddy Lance out with uh, the question of the day? Yeah. So the question of the day is brought to you by Can-Am. Hunting is what we do and why we take our purpose-built hunting vehicles so seriously. Hi, my name is Lance Weathers from Georgetown, Illinois. My question is, how do you guys know which does to target, especially come late season? We've always been after the old mature does, trying to keep the buck to doe ratio correct and we just seem to have a lot of deer high density area just didn't know if you guys ever try and shoot younger does to maybe keep the herd a little better in check or do you just always target the the older does thank you i, I think our our thought process on this has probably evolved through the years you know back in the day probably we're looking for that most mature doe but now I think it depends on your deer density. If it's super high, you probably a mouth at the table is a mouth at the table. Yeah. So and when it gets to the late season, the biggest thing we're looking for is make sure it hadn't shed its antlers or it, that it doesn't have buttons. Those are the two big things that you're trying to, especially like, you know, a lot of times we'll take that late muzzleloader season in Missouri or Iowa, you know, take mm -hmm. that opportunity to harvest several more sure. deer and it's a little bit easier, you know, and, and it just, you, that's what you really got to, especially if you're taking a longer shot, you really got to look and watch. I remember a few years ago we were at dad's. He used to have the, the in Missouri, the antlerless season used to be later in the year. It was, it was perfect. It was at the end of the season mm -hmm. and they, they have since moved it up into like the first week of December, which isn't ideal necessarily if you're still after a buck, yeah. you know? So anyways, we, dad would have the whole construction crew in, uh, from his construction company and we would sit, you know, different blinds around the 
property and we would have a weekend of it and try to kill as many as we could. And this was before they limited tag numbers too. So, you know, you, you had unlimited tags that you could buy yeah. for, for does. And I remember Aaron Bennett and I were sitting in a spot and, uh, this was, and, and this is maybe the first or second time I had ever shot a muzzle loader. And so we had, he had a muzzle loader. I had a muzzle loader and you know, a couple deer came out and then also a couple more. And it's like, all right, we're going to shoot this one. And I had like, we were looking at both with binoculars, like just try, trying to make sure, trying to make sure. And I'm like, man, I don't, I had, so d- going backwards, I had missed one already in the night. I okay. had missed a deer totally. And so, so this time I'm like, all right, I got to you know, dad's going <laughs> to give me a lot of crap here. So I'm going to make sure that this is actually a, a it was a fawn, you know, and not, yeah. and, and not a button buck or whatever. And so finally Aaron's like, it was at 40 yards to start and we had watched it so long and it just kind of kept feeding and walking. And finally it was out to like a hundred yards and he's like, you better shoot it. I'm like, I think it's got buttons. I think I could see buttons you know and he's like no it's a it's a you know you're good it's good Uh shoot it so i shoot it i drop it and we're like yeah i got it you know we walk out to get it it was a damn button (laughs) 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 so so uh, so we go you know everybody you know we probably killed 30 the 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 whole group over the weekend you know and we're sitting there and we're field dressing them and all that stuff and i was like well dad i shot a button buck sorry he's like hey i did too he's like at this point i'm out some mouth you know (laughs) well because at that this was a deck decade ago uh-huh. he, his deer density was probably six seven ten to one i mean it was it was nuts uh-huh. it was just crazy yeah. and he had way too many deer and we felt like that was affecting the antler growth which we still have that issue there sure. but anyway so that's a I long picture you like like oh, oh like, yeah don't hit me <laughs> so you know it was one of those deals where oh, ideally you're taking the oldest doe because that's the one that usually busts you but agreed hey if you're in the late season you're trying to get some mouths off the table. Sometimes, you know, a, a young fawn ain't the, the worst thing in the world either. Sure. John, you have an opinion there? Um, you know, when, when Matt was talking, one of the biggest ones that always surprised me was the late season muzzleloader hunt in Iowa. And I lived in Iowa for four years and my buddy was always draw that tag. And I'm just, I would, I was always so nervous to draw that tag because you know, especially when you're shooting with a muzzleloader they're you know, they're going to be a hundred, 150 yards or whatever. And you have, well, that's a big doe. And then you go up there and it's got, you know, holes where the you know, were. Probably 180 inch rack was that <laughs> dropped and you're like, Oh dang, you know, that it's just always made me nervous. And, and the other way that I look at it too, is, you know, those does are probably carrying a, they could be carrying the next 200 inch buck, you know? And, and yeah. so I've just, I try to shoot my does early. And uh, so I, I don't usually shoot them late, but it's just one of those things that uh, I, you know, I'm torn on it. It depends on density and depends on a lot of different things, but I'm, I'm going hunting this weekend. Uh, my friend um, has a piece of property down in Southern Wisconsin and the season goes until the end of January. And uh, he's actually selling that property. So he's like, let's go kill as much Amen. as we can kill on this property. Yeah. So we're going to go down there this guys. weekend and, <laughs> and we got tags and we're going to go clean house. And uh doesn't matter what it is this weekend. We're just going to, lay him down. So. Son of a, I'm sure Fun. the next landover owner is really happy about this. <laughs> yeah, the previous landover I know, I know who it is too. So I'm not, I won't say it cause it's, it's actually a, a, a big, um, vendor in the outdoor industry that's buying a property. <laughs> so, I, well, yeah, that's ballsy. Nice yeah. job. I remember when I had <laughs> my first beer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's uh, let's hop into the wildlife word. It is brought to you by Muddy Outdoors, home of the highest quality products for serious hunters. So uh, we have another multiple choice. Um, obviously, most does are bred by now. They're actively gestating um, deer fetuses. If a doe's nutrition is too poor to bring a fawn to full gestation, she may do this: a absorb the unborn fawn. I can eat it. <laughs> Continue. Do I have to, or can I leave now? Yeah, you can go. I mean, I don't like this part <laughs> anyway. <Anyways. laughs> can she, will she absorb the unborn fawn through her uterus, Matt Drury, <laughs> birth it prematurely near a nursing cow, C, abort the fawn, or D, carry the unborn fawn in utero until the following spring? John, our guests always get to go first. <laughs> uh, 
I would say it would absorb it back into whatever it was A. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to go with that D. My choice. Okay. So, so it would birth a year and a half year old fawn at that point. Actually, I didn't understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> you make these tricky. You're such a jerk. You know what? I'm not feeling like birthing this baby this year. I'm just going to let it roll till next year. I thought it was like she pooped it out at the end of the term here. <laughs> <laughs> well, what so is it? Thank you, St. Genevieve uh, Public School System, for the strong sex ed I program. I went to they college have. too. <laughs> So white tailed does do not abort their fetuses; <laughs> they absorb them, they reabsorb them. Yeah, that's what I said. They eat them. Yeah, yeah, of course, you got it right, man. Nice job. <laughs> <laughs> you mean like poop them out their butt? <laughs> well, look, I've been hanging around a six year old and a four year old a lot. <laughs> a lot of poop questions. Yeah. So hopefully, people feel like they've been empowered and educated now. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good times. Well, John, Mama anything else big on the horizon people need to be watching for from Fairdyne in general before we wrap things up? I'm really, I'm asking you, know, you to save us here. We'll, we'll continue to uh, we'll continue to grow, innovate, do the different things that that we've got doing. You know, we've we've got uh, some cool new products this year. You know, there's a, a new shift knock from our nocturnal brand that has a it's actually got a switch on the side of it that allows you to nice. turn the knock on and off I could use some um, of those <laughs> yeah and uh so that was one of the things so that's that's what we try to do is we try to listen to our consumers and and that's why we like with rage we call it the evolution you know and we we try to continually do things to improve the brand um all of our different brands and so for all of our different brands, we've got some cool stuff this year and we'll have a lot of cool stuff as we go into uh next year, um, 2022. So, you know, we've got some cool new things this year that try NC shift knock, like I say, some new technology in the IQ brand, um, S4, just lots of different things. You know, we have 20, 21 brands, 22 brands, I think now. And, uh, you know, we, we've, it, it's tough to do it all, but, um, we continue to do it. And we have a really good team of, of, uh, our new product development team is, is, really come a long way in the past few years. And so we've got some, some really cool stuff in all of our brands. So sweet. Can't wait to see some lighted broadheads. Imagine <laughs> what that would look like. <laughs> just, that that just, was a new product idea from one of our reps several years ago. You know, let's light the broadhead. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't we just like fire your bang Robin Hood here. Freaking bang symbols in the tree stand. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I like so. it. <laughs> I'm thinking like a full <laughs> LED for your arrow shaft. <laughs> It'd be like a laser beam. <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Tracers. Well, we should probably <laughs> stop now. All right. Well, John, we appreciate you jumping on. We appreciate the partnership, the innovation. You guys have always been, you know, leading the way and uh, <clears throat> the industry has improved in a lot of ways because of it. So thank you. And we appreciate everything. I appreciate, we appreciate you guys. Thanks for having me on. All right, buddy. Until next time. Peace See out. Ya. We're adding new videos every week, so make sure to click that subscribe button and check out all of our amazing content. This segment of DoD TV was brought to you by Rage Broadheads, leading the evolution in lethal technology.